Welcome, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today for this webinar on the broadband data collection designed for tribal leaders and tribal filers. Broadband mapping has long been of great importance to tribal nations. My name is Sairi Rajapaksa, and I'm acting chief of the FCC's Office of Native Affairs and Policy. I'm joined today by Barbara Esben, Deputy Bureau Chief in the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, which oversees ONAP as part of its governmental portfolio. I am also joined by the staff of the Office of Native Affairs and Policy. I would like to give special thanks to ONAP Legal Advisor Lloyd Collier for all his great work in organizing this webinar. I would also like to acknowledge Derek Goatson and Greg Collegian, Legal Advisors in ONAP. You'll be able to send questions to the team by placing them in the Q&A box. In the low right-hand corner of your screens, you will see three dots next to the chat box. Clicking on them will open the Q&A box. It is also still possible to send questions into the email box, bdcwebinar at fcc.gov. Questions are encouraged and will be accepted throughout, but they will be addressed in the question and answer portion of the webinar. I must also remind you that this webinar is being recorded and streamed live. With that, I will turn this presentation over to Sean Spivey, Senior Counsel and Chief of Staff for the FCC's Broadband Data Task Force. Sean. Thanks, Irene. Hi, and thank you for joining today's webinar on the Federal Communications Commission's new broadband data collection. I'm Sean Spivey, Senior Counsel and Chief of Staff of the Broadband Data Task Force here at the FCC. The Broadband Data Collection, or BDC, is a new framework for collecting information on broadband service availability, born out of the Broadband Data Act. As most of you participating today know well, the current Form 477 broadband deployment data leave a lot to be desired and have historically overstated broadband availability, particularly on tribal lands. The new BDC program will collect location-level information on fixed broadband service availability throughout the country. And for the first time, this data will be subject to review by governmental entities, individual consumers, and other third parties, as well as verification by the FCC. The broadband maps the FCC will create from this new data will play a critical role in the efforts of federal, state, and tribal governments to ensure that essential broadband services are made available throughout the United States and that broadband infrastructure funding is carefully targeted to the areas most in need. We recognize that access to high-speed internet is lacking in tribal nations. Mapping broadband availability in tribal areas and deploying broadband infrastructure over tribal lands both present unique challenges. Timely and accurate data from service providers and, ac and active participation in the challenge processes from tribal nations and their members is therefore of paramount importance, and we thank you for participating in today's program. The information we will share during this webinar will help tribal entities, including representatives of tribal nations, tribal internet service providers, and other tribal representatives, navigate the BDC system and submit data which will help improve the FCC's maps. As Sairi was saying, we have reserved some time for questions after the tutorials and presentations, so participants are encouraged to email questions to bdcwebinar at fcc.gov, and we will do our best to answer them as time allows. If we are unable to answer a specific question today, you may submit your question via the FCC's online BDC Help Center at fcc.gov forward slash broadband data forward slash help. You can find additional information and resources in the BDC Help Center, as well as a detailed user guide for the BDC system. The website will be regularly updated and additional resources and FAQs and I, with, with additional resources and FAQs, sorry. <laughs> and I would encourage you to visit the website often throughout this process. Following the initial system demonstrations and presentations, we will take a brief break before the Q&A session begins. Again, you can email questions to bdcwebinar at fcc.gov throughout today's event. We appreciate you taking the time to watch this webinar and hope that it will be helpful as you participate in the inaugural BDC filing window which opened on June 30th and will close on September 1st, 2022. With that, let's start our first tutorial video on how to log into the BDC system. Hello, 
and welcome to our online tutorial on logging into the Commission's new Broadband Data Collection System, or BDC. In this tutorial, I'll show you how to log into the BDC. Starting at the BDC login screen, you'll see a form with fields for username and password. Enter the username and password you created in the FCC User Registration System. You can learn more about creating an FCC user registration by visiting FCC.gov forward slash commission dash registration dash system dash video dash tutorials. If you're having issues with logging in, click the Need Help Signing In link found below the Sign In button. Clicking the link will reveal two additional links, Forgot Password and Help. The Forget Password option will redirect you to the Reset screen where you'll enter your email address or username and click Reset via email. If successful, you'll receive an email with password reset instructions. If you still need assistance, click Help on the main login page, and this will take you to an external Okta page where you can find help with any additional sign-on questions you may have. Let's go back to the main sign-on page. Go ahead and log in with your username and password. You do have the option to check Remember Me, but it's not recommended for shared devices. Now we're on the Entity Selection page where you can access all FRNs associated with your username in the Commission Registration System. The Entity Selection page is a table, and it includes an FRN column that is the entity's FCC registration number, an Entity Name column, an Entity Type column, either Service Provider, Government, or Other, a Filing Status column, including a tooltip signifying the filing status for the entity's most recent filing window, and lastly, an Action Required column, including a tooltip alerting you of any pertinent information related to the selected filing. Now, select the FRN of the entity you wish to file. On the Entity Information page, the BDC collects basic but vital contact information. You'll be periodically prompted to return to this page to confirm that the contact information is correct. If you've entered information before via broadband data collection, some of your data will auto-populate such as entity type, holding company, common control name, and ILEC status. Confirm those data are accurate too. Please note fields will vary depending on your entity type, and that's how you access your entity's information page. Thanks, Kimia. The next video segment demonstrates the steps that governmental entities, including tribal nations, must take to complete the entity information page in the BDC system. Hello, and welcome to our online tutorial on how to complete the entity information page for government entities. Let's get started on the entity information page. From the Select Entity Type drop-down menu, select Government. You must fill out all fields except those marked optional. The first field is Entity's Government Type. Click the appropriate radio button for Tribal, Federal, State, or Local. Note, your Government Entity Type must match the Employer Identification Number associated with your FRN. Next is the URL your Government Entity uses. If it doesn't have a website, click the checkbox. Next is the type of data being submitted. Select either broadband availability data or bulk challenge data. And now, on to contact information. Your data contact is the person who can answer questions from the FCC. You may provide a different data contact when certifying your submission. Your certifying official contact should be the official whose signature certifies the truthfulness and correctness of information contained in a submission. This includes his or her address. Click International Address if needed. You may always specify a different certifying official contact for each submission. You can enter different names for each contact or use the same information in multiple places. Once you've entered all the information, click Save. This will automatically redirect you to the submissions dashboard page. But as we saw in the last video, governmental entities that are not facilities-based broadband internet service providers must use the checkboxes on the entity information page to indicate whether they intend to submit broadband availability data, bulk crowdsource or challenge data, or both. Governmental entities will only be able to submit broadband availability data into the BDC if they are authenticated as an entity that is, quote, primarily responsible for mapping or tracking broadband internet access service coverage, unquote, in their jurisdiction. 
That's a requirement from the Broadband Data Act. The FCC has set up a two-step process for authenticating these governmental entities. First, the entity must be registered as a governmental entity in the FCC's Commission Registration System, or CORS. Since the BDC system will perform a check on the entity type listed on the entity information page against the information for your FRN included in CORS, you likely will have already completed this first step. But you should be sure to update the information for your FRN in CORS to indicate that your FRN is associated with a tribal government prior to completing the entity information page in the BDC system, as was just demonstrated. The second step for submitting verified availability data requires that at least 45 days prior to the opening of a BDC filing window, the tribal governmental entity submit a letter from an elected tribal leader of the tribal government identifying the entity as primarily responsible for mapping or tracking broadband service. The letter must be filed using the FCC's Electronic Common Filing System, or ECFS, in docket numbers 19-195 and 11-10. The tribal leader only needs to designate the entity once, not each reporting cycle. Alternatively, should a tribe not have a designated entity primarily responsible for mapping or tracking broadband internet access service coverage, we will accept data from tribal governmental entities that have been authenticated through the CORS and BDC systems, as described in the first step. Note that this second step is only required to the extent a governmental entity wants to submit verified availability data in the BDC. This second step is not necessary for governmental entities that want to submit challenge or crowdsource data. You can find more information on the process for authenticating governmental entities in the public notice that the Broadband Data Task Force issued on April 14th of this year, which is available on the BDC website. The next video demonstrates the information that service providers must include when completing the entity information page in the BDC. Please note that to the extent a governmental entity is also a broadband service provider, it should register in the system as a service provider rather than a governmental entity. We'll now play that video. Hello, and welcome to our online tutorial on how to complete the Entity Information page for service providers. From the Select Entity Type drop-down menu, select Service Provider. You must fill out all fields except those marked optional. First, specify whether the entity is an incumbent local exchange carrier, or ILEC for short. If it is, you'll need to do two things. First, you'll need to enter study area codes and form 499 filer IDs further down this page. Second, you must file fixed voice subscription data, which is done later in the filing process. In the next field, enter the brand name or names associated with your entity. Click the field, type in the name or names, press tab or enter on your keyboard to save the form. To delete a brand name, click the X beside it. Next, enter the holding company or common control name. Again, if you've previously submitted information, it should be pre-populated. If you need to make any changes, click the edit icon. If you're a first-time user, you must submit data for this field. Enter the parent company name or names associated with the filings of all your commonly owned or controlled entities. You can select from a pre-populated list. If your name isn't listed, type in the full name and press enter. Next is the URL your entity uses for primary business. Enter this information. If there isn't a website, click the checkbox indicating there is no website. Now let's move on to study area codes. Voice service providers eligible for Universal Service Fund support have a six-digit study area code, including all ILEX and some fixed voice or mobile service providers. You can search by study area code or type in the specific field and click the name to add it to your form. If you make a mistake, simply click X to delete it. If there is no study area code, then you're ready to click the checkbox below the form. Next is Form 499 Filer IDs. All voice service providers should have a Form 499 filer ID, including all ILIC providers. Search either by six-digit code or by Form 499 filer ID's name. When you see the correct Form 499 filer ID, click the name to add to the form. If you choose the wrong ID, click X to delete it. If your entity doesn't have a Form 499 ID, click the checkbox. 
And now, on to contact information. Your data contact is the person who can answer questions from the FCC. You may provide a different data contact when certifying your submission. Your emergency operations contact should be the go-to person for network status information during natural disasters and other emergencies. You may also provide a different emergency operations contact when certifying your submission. Your certifying official contact should be the person whose signature confirms all your information is correct and true in your submission. This includes his or her address. Click international address if needed. You can specify another certifying official contact for each submission. Your certifying engineer should be either the certified professional engineer or corporate engineering officer who directly knows about and is responsible for generating availability data, including supporting data. Your certifying engineer must have examined all your information for accuracy and accordance with your entity's ordinary course of network design and engineering. If you check the box, this company submits only fixed voice subscription data and is not required to submit an engineering certification, you will not be allowed to upload availability or supporting data once you reach the submission overview page. You can enter different names for all four contacts or use the same information in multiple places. Once you've entered all the information, click Save. This will automatically redirect you to the submissions dashboard page. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Chelsea Fallon. I'm the Senior Implementation Officer with the Broadband Data Task Force, and I am going to walk through the process of how governmental entities can gain access to the broadband serviceable location fabric, um, also known as the fabric. We also have an article in our online BDC Help Center that lays out the steps in this process, and I will post a link to that in the chat right now. And so we'll talk more uh, later about the fabric, but it essentially is a data set of all of the locations across the United States and its territories to which uh, fixed broadband service is available or could be installed, and it must be used as the basis for submitting challenges to the BDC fixed availability data and to the fabric data itself. So the first steps in obtaining access to the fabric involve getting access to the BDC system, logging in, and filling out the entity information page which we have covered um, in some of these earlier video tutorials. But just to reiterate, if you do not already have one, you should obtain an FCC username and password, as well as an FCC registration number or an FRN for your entity in CORS, the Commission Registration System. And when creating your FRN, you must select the entity type that matches your government type, and one of which is, um, is tribal that can be selected. Then you can log in to the BDC system at bdc.fcc.gov using the username and password that was created in CORS. After logging in, you should see any FRNs associated with your username. You can click on the FRN, um, for the government entity that is seeking access to the fabric data set. After you click on that, that will take you to that entity information page and where you should enter the required information as described in that earlier video. Once you've submitted that entity information page in the system, the FCC staff will review the information and provide the contact information for approved entities to CostQuest. That's the FCC's 
contractor for the fabric. CostQuest Cost will then email the contacts entered in the BDC system further instructions and a link to CostQuest website to create a user account. After you've completed the licensing process with them, they will send you a link to download the fabric data files. The link to download the data will be emailed to the license requester, the administrator, and any recipients associated with the entity that were listed in the, the initial license request form with CostQuest. I will note that if you are a service provider, um, you should have already received an email from CostQuest about getting access to the fabric. If you did not, or you think it may have gotten lost or sent to the wrong person, you can send an email to CostQuest requesting access at nbfsupport at costquest.com. I can put that email in the chat as well. And then there are additional resources on the BDC Help Center online related to the fabric. And now we are going to show a video with more information on what the fabric is and how to work with it. Thank you. Let's start with a quick overview. I'll cover such topics as what the fabric, including the preliminary fabric, is and is not, how to access it, and how to use it in a location list versus polygon filing in the BDC. I'll also talk about what you can do with the fabric data after downloading it, what precisely you are looking at once you open the file, how do you work with the data, and how you can align that data with existing data, such as latitude, longitude, customer lists, map overlay, and so forth. A preliminary objective of the BDC is to establish a broadband serviceable location fabric. What is that? Well, it is a common data set of all locations in the United States and its territories that have or could have broadband internet access service. The Broadband Data Act and the FCC's rules require that the fabric serve as the foundation upon which all fixed broadband availability data be reported and overlaid. It serves as the denominator as we work to determine where broadband service is and where it is not. The fabric allows both the FCC and you to work from a standardized list of locations. But note, the fabric will continue to be updated and refined over time. A revised version will be released prior to each semi-annual BDC filing window for use at that time. So you should always ensure you're working with the most current version of the production fabric. Let's look at the key fields in the fabric data set. First, the location ID. This is the unique commission issued identifier for each location in the data. As mentioned earlier, the location ID used in the preliminary fabric will be different from the location ID in the production version. Next, the geographic coordinates. These are the latitude and longitude associated with each location. These coordinates are within the boundary or footprint of the building that serves as the basis for a location. The address for each location is made up of five fields. The primary or street address, the city, state, zip code, and four-digit zip suffix. Note that some locations in the fabric do not have an address associated with them, so some or all the, of these fields may be null. The unit cost lists the number of separate units in a building. It is especially important for buildings with multiple units, such as an apartment or condominium. The unit cost field is null or empty in the preliminary fabric. Next, the BSL flag. The fabric will include both broadband serviceable locations, BSLs, and non-BSLs, and this field indicates whether a location is a BSL or not. Unlike the production fa fabric, this flag is set to true for all locations in the preliminary fabric. The data included in this field is likely to change for many locations between the preliminary and production versions of the fabric. Some points identified in the preliminary fabric may not be considered BSLs in the production fabric and vice versa. The building type code field, indicates whether a location is business, residential, or both business and residential. Finally, the data set includes information on certain census geographies, including the county and census block on which a location falls. The data source that CostQuest uses to generate the data in the fabric include a mix of parcel data, other land and tax record, satellite imagery, 
address databases, and other available sources deemed helpful to determine the locations throughout the United States where fixed broadband service can be installed. You may submit fixed availability data in one of two formats in the BDC system, either a list of locations or a polygon coverage area. And the fabric is used differently in preparing your data depending on which format you choose. Note that you must choose only one format for your fixed availability data in each BDC filing. If you choose to submit availability data as a list of locations, then your file must contain data on all of the locations to which you currently provide fixed broadband service or can provide fixed broadband service with a standard broadband installation as identified in the FCC rules. The locations reported must be based on the fabric locations and the file must list locations by the fabric location ID, the unique FCC location identifier. Your file must be in CSV format and conform to section 6.1 of the BDC availability data specification. If you choose to submit availability data as a coverage polygon, rather than a list of locations, your data file must be in an accepted GIS format with polygon geometries and associated data attributes. Please see the accompanying tutorial on fixed availability data, as well as section 6.2 of the BDC availability data specification for more information. Coverage polygons must also encompass only locations to which you either currently have a broadband connection in service or could perform a standard broadband installation. Therefore, if you choose this option, you can use GIS software to overlay the fabric data on your footprint to see which locations fall inside of it. We also note that after you upload Polygon GIS data in the BDC system, you will be able to see which locations from the fabric overlap your fixed coverage area. I'm now going to turn to a description of ways you can align your availability data to the production version of the fabric. You can apply these approaches using the preliminary fabric data as a way to prepare for the type of data processing you will need to undertake to match your data to the production fabric. Let me repeat and reemphasize what I said a few minutes ago. Use the preliminary fabric to develop and test methods to align your data with the fabric, but be sure to use the most recent production version, not the preliminary version, to compile your avail availability data to, for your BDC filing. Many of the locations and all of the location IDs will change. So how do you open the Fabric data file after you download it from CrossQuest? The Fabric file is in commerce separated value format, so the most popular program you can use is Microsoft Excel. You will first need to unzip the folder containing the Fabric CSV file by right-clicking the file and selecting Extract All. Next, select the destination for storage of the unzipped file. The pop-up window contains the unzipped file and you can double-click to open the file in Excel if that is your default program. What are you looking at now that it's open? The Excel table should look like something like the one shown here. There are other programs you can use to open your CSV, such as Windows Notepad or TextEdit, or other spreadsheet software programs. You can do this by right-clicking on the CSV file and select Open With, then selecting your program of choice, just such as Notepad. How do you work with the data? You may want to perform a procedure known as text matching which compares fabric locations with your address location list. This can help you identify the fabric location ID associated with an address list you have created for locations that you serve. The idea here is to try to match the address information in the fabric with lists of addresses to which you can or do provide service that you have compiled internally. You can do this several ways in Excel by using a combination of the concat function, ampersand symbol, and text join function before using the VLOOKUP function. You can also use an add-on called Fuzzy Lookup to find fuzzy or imperfect matches. More information about text matching can be found in the BDC Help Center, and a link will be provided at the end of this presentation. The article is called Text Matching in Excel. The first step is to pull together the address primary, state, city, zip, and zip subtext fields associated with the fabric location ID into a single column. This will make comparison to your existing list easier. Using the text join function, you can combine the text from multiple ranges and or strings and include a specified delimiter between each text value. To use text join in the fabric, one, insert a new column to the left of, of the location ID column. Two, type equals text join, open parentheses, and then add a comma delimiter between quotation marks. 
Type another comma and specify if you want to ignore empty cells. Enter true. Add a comma and then add the cells you wish to combine and end with a close parentheses. This can be combined with other methods like using ampersand and removing spaces to get the correct formatting. After formatting your data the way you want it, use the VLOOKUP function to match the addresses in your data to the location ID in the fabric. Add a new worksheet to the file and copy over your list of addresses. When you copy your list, make sure that the full address, including city, state, and zip code, are in a single column in the worksheet. In an empty column, type equals VLOOKUP and an open parentheses. Then click the first cell in your address column. This is what you will be using as a reference to look up the addresses in the fabric data. Then add a comma and enter the range, column and cells, of cells containing the fabric addresses. Add another comma and enter the range of cells from the location ID column. Add one final column, and if you want to return an approximate or exact match, add a one for true or a zero for false, and then end with a close parentheses. Drag or double click the square in the bottom right corner of the cell to this formula to fill it in for all rows in the list. If your data produces a lot of unmatched addresses, you can use the fuzzy lookup, an add-on for Microsoft Excel instead of VLOOKUP to fuzzy join similar rows between your data and the fabric. A fuzzy join are joins between two data sets that don't match exactly. The matching is robust for a wide variety of errors, including spelling mistakes, abbreviations, synonyms, and added missing data, and will produce a similarity column after the matches to show you how well they fit. First, install the fuzzy lookup add-in in Excel by downloading the installation file, opening it, and following the instru install instructions. You, you will need to restart Excel to find the fuzzy lookup tab. Prepare both your data and the fabric by formatting it into tables. Highlight the data and go to Tab, Insert, and click Table. Please note, both the fabric and your address list must be in the same Excel workbook. Next, you can create your fuzzy lookup by opening a new worksheet or select the column where you want your matches to go. First, click on Fuzzy Lookup in the new Fuzzy Lookup tab in Excel. Next, select the two tables you are using and highlight the columns from each table to base your matches on and then add them to the match columns. Once you have your columns picked out to match against, select and unselect your output columns so that only those that you want in the output table are selected. Click Go. Finally, you can check your results. The similarity column will be the last column in the new match table. A score of 1.0 is a perfect match. De decreasing scores indicate a less per perfect match was made. As you can see in the video where our data has streets spelled out, but the fabric has it abbreviated to ST. The address still matched with 0.9129 similarity. Ways to map the data. Another way to match fabric location IDs to your coverage area is by displaying the locations using their coordinates on a map. By comparing this map to your existing service area maps, you can identify BSLs where you can or do provide service. For this video, we are using QGIS 3 for our GIS software to map the location fabric data, starting with the CSV file provided. Open QGIS and select the Layer menu. Hover the cursor over Add Layer and select Add Delimited Text Layer. Select the file from the File Name field in the pop-up window. Ensure that the latitude and longitude coordinates are correct based on the Geometry Definition tab. The Y coordinate is the latitude, the X coordinate is the longitude. You'll know right away if you reverse them since your points will be nowhere near where you'd expect. Make sure you select ESPG 4326 WGS84 for Geometry CRS. Click Add. Now the CSV should display as points on the display. Add a base map by selecting XYZ tiles in the browser pane to make a connection to a URL or by selecting OpenStreetMap to confirm the locations are correct. From here, you can select certain points by clicking the Select tool highlighted in the image. You can draw a box around the points. Open the attribute table by right-clicking the layer and select Open Attributes. 
You can also manually click each row of the attribute table to select specific points or run a filter. You can also select fields to filter out. So here are a few more things to note when using the fabric to prepare your availability data for the BDC. One, use the fabric to generate availability data by location, not by census block. One goal of broadband data collection is to have more precise and granular data on broadband availability down to the individual location for fixed service. Therefore, filers should not overlay the census blocks reported in FCC Form 477 on the fabric and report all of those locations. They must determine which locations, not which census blocks they serve. Two, use the preliminary data to prepare your processes for generating fixed availability data, either by location list or polygon for the BDC. Make sure you download and use the production fabric data when creating the data you will submit in the BDC system. The production data will differ significantly from the preliminary data. If you plan to submit a list of locations for your fixed broadband availability data in the BDC system, you must use the fabric points as the basis for that list and that file. If you plan to submit a coverage polygon, the fabric can be helpful in determining and validating your footprint, but the GIS file you upload should not include fabric point data, only polygon data. Hello, I'm Ed Bartholomew, the Senior Outreach Director for the FCC's Broadband Data Task Force. And as you saw in the last video, working with our contractor CostQuest, the FCC has created the fabric. One way to think of the fabric is the set of points that will appear on the map once it is published. And as we discussed earlier, there are processes in place for both gov tribal governments and tribal providers to access the current production version of the fabric. That is the first step in both submitting availability data and challenging the fabric data to improve the accuracy of the FCC's maps of broadband serviceable location. Well, once you're able to download the fabric data file, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, you can consult materials on our online help center, including the walkthrough video that we just shared. And we've also released a number of articles some of which in include step-by-step -step instructions for the data matching techniques that were shown in the video. We also have an FAQ on the fabric as part of our technical assistance to broadband data collection stakeholders, all of which may be useful as you begin your process to review the fabric. As the video showed, the fabric is provided as a zip archive file. Each archive consists of two files. One file contains all of the location records within the counties included in your service area or jurisdiction. The other file, whose name contains secondary, will contain additional addresses corresponding to location IDs with multiple addresses, according to CostQuest data sources. Both files are made available in comma-separated values, or CSV, format. Fabric data is made available on a county basis, and the data you receive may include locations that are outside of your service or tribal land footprint. For, avail for availability filings, you should only report in the BDC the locations that you have a connection in service or could serve with a standard broadband installation. Each record in the fabric data set includes the 15-digit census block code for the location so that the filer can filter the data to remove locations in census blocks outside of your footprint. As you begin to review the locations contained in the fabric data for your area, you'll notice that some locations in the fabric have a BSL flag of false, and this is a, a field in the fabric data set BSL flag, um, some of which may be indicated as false. These are structures that have or should have broadband service, but likely do not take or would not take mass market service, and therefore don't fall within the definition of a broadband serviceable location based on available data. Examples of such locations include certain community anchor institutions and large enterprises, such as libraries or hospitals. These locations can provide a reference point and context when filers are determining the BSLs in their service area. 
If you believe that such a location has been misidentified as a non-BSL and should actually be a broadband serviceable location or vice versa, you can submit that information as part of a fabric challenge, which we'll discuss in more detail shortly. Providing information on these locations in the fabric data set will make it easier for filers of bulk fabric challenges to indicate that a BSL flag or broadband serviceable location flag should be changed as opposed to requiring a challenger to provide all new identifying information for a new broadband serviceable location. If there are locations where you provide service that are either missing from the list of fabric locations you received or are flagged as false, do not include them as part of your availability data submission. Instead, we encourage you to consider them as a candidate for the fabric challenge process. It's important to remember that the broadband data collection will be an iterative process that will continually update and improve our broadband availability data. And we understand that you know your community better than we do and will play an important role in this iterative process. To facilitate your participation, we do have upcoming challenge processes that will give service providers as well as state, local, and tribal governments and third-party entities two opportunities to dispute the accuracy of data in the broadband data collection, one for the fabric and one for availability data. The FCC will receive challenge data for both fabric and availability challenges in two ways. The broadband maps will include functionality permitting challenges to an individual location directly through the map interface. We expect that consumers will use this method to submit challenges for their own residences or small businesses. The FCC will also receive bulk challenge data through the BDC fi systems filing interface, not the public map. Information on how to format this data is provided in the data specifications. The data specification for mobile and fabric bulk challenges, fabric bulk challenge data have been released and the specifications for fixed availability bulk challenges are forthcoming. We expect that broadband service providers and tribal entities that have information for multiple locations will use this bulk method to submit challenges. Bulk fabric challenges filed by states, localities, tribes, and providers will be accepted after the filing window closes on September 1st. Bulk availability challenges will begin to be accepted after the initial maps are published in the fall of 2022. Individual availability challenges and individual fabric challenges will also be accepted once the maps are released. And again, that can be done directly through the map interface. Today, we're gonna to focus on the bulk fabric challenge process um, that you can begin to prepare for now. Fabric challenges dispute the accuracy of the location data included in the fabric. In general, the following circumstances will form the basis of a challenge to fabric data. A location that meets the commission's definition of a broadband serviceable location is not included in the fabric. In other words, the location's missing. A location's classification as being a broadband serviceable location is incorrect. Information about a location is incorrect in the fabric. For example, the address or unit count for the location is not correct. Or the location's placement, or basically the geographic coordinates associated with the location are incorrect. The FCC released guidance on and a data specification for bulk fabric challengers on July 1st. You can find links to those documents on fcc.gov forward slash broadband data. And then you'll find them there on the resources tab and I'll drop a link to that in the chat after I'm finished. Once the opportunity to submit bulk fabric challenges opens, challengers should, should submit their data as soon as possible to increase the likelihood that the results of their challenges can be incorporated into the next version of the fabric data. The next version will be released later this year in advance of the opening of the next filing window, which is December 31st. And I see that Kimia dropped that link in the chat. Thank you, Kimia. So how can you start to prepare for the fabric challenge process? 
The first thing to do is to develop a strategy for analyzing and validating the fabric data for your jurisdiction to determine whether challenges are warranted. For example, you may have a list of E911 locations or other tax and land records that you can match to fabric locations using some of the tools shown in the video. After analyzing the fabric data set, if you discover that there are locations not included in the fabric, you will next need to confirm that these locations align with the FCC's definitions of a broadband serviceable location. And that's a single point to represent a building that would subscribe to mass market broadband service. And if they do meet that definition, then they're likely a good candidate for a challenge. To help review the param to help, we suggest reviewing the parameters set forth in the July 1st public notice as to what constitutes a broadband serviceable location and have an understanding of the type of structure and other attributes associated with the locations you've identified as potential challenge candidates. If you find you have a basis for submitting challenges to the fabric, you'll need to format your challenge data according to the requirements laid out in the fabric bulk challenge data specification. The data will need to be uploaded as a tabular CSV file in the broadband data collection system once the bulk fabric challenge process opens. The data file must conform to the data specifications in order to be accepted in the BDC system. And in the weeks ahead, we plan to release additional support materials and sample files to help you in preparing your bulk challenge submissions. Individual locations that appear to be missing or miscategorized within a jurisdiction may be more efficiently addressed through an individual challenge submitted directly in the map interface once the maps are released in the fall of this year. Mobilizing tribal members or community partners to participate directly in the, avail in the availability challenge process that will be coming later in the fall once the maps are released may also spur more individuals to similarly fight, file challenges about fabric location issues that need to be addressed. Next, we'll show a short video that demonstrates how providers will file their fixed availability and supporting data in the BDC system. Welcome to the third and final video on submitting fixed availability data. After the subscription data has been added and validation is finished, we can now take a look at uploading availability files from the availability data page. In this video, we will go over the process for service providers and other entities. There are differences in the procedures between entity types, which I'll highlight. We will then look at how to review map data and discuss the procedures of submitting supporting data. After the subscription data has been added, and validation is finished, we can now take a look at uploading availability files from the availability data page. To begin an availability data submission, you can click on the Upload Availability button, which is located on the top left of the Submission Overview page. The next step is to select Fixed Broadband as the type of availability data you'd like to upload. The File Type drop-down menu will update dynamically based on your data type selection. You will then be presented with the following file type options once you select your data type. CSV, ESRI shapefile, GeoJSON, ESRI file GDB, or GeoPackage. Click the Browse button and select the file or files you wish to upload, then click the Upload Data button. You will then see a table populate on the page that includes columns for file name, type, date, upload, status, map, and manage. The map and manage columns will remain blank until your file has completed processing. As the file begins to process, you will see one of two statuses for each file. These are the same status types as previously stated with fixed subscription data. If your file passes both the virus scan and the validations check, the system will display a status of valid with a green check mark. This means that the data you've entered and uploaded is valid and has been accepted into the system. You will also see that a review map link has been added to the table on the page, and you can now manage your data, either by downloading the file or deleting the file. If the file you've uploaded fails any of the validation checks, the system will show a red status of data errors. There will also be an expandable View Details link that will allow you to view any validation errors within your file. 
If your file contains any validation errors, you will not be able to progress further through the system. You'll need to fix any errors and re-upload your file. Continue to upload as many availability files as possible to satisfy your entity's submission requirements. We can then review the map data. After successfully uploading valid availability data, a review map link will appear on the availability data page that will allow you to review a map of your data submission on a file-by-file -file basis. The review map page features various filters that allow you to explore your data using interactive map, ensuring the accuracy of your availability data submission. The filters on the map will update dynamically based on the file you've selected to review on the map. You'll be able to view a map filtered by your selected combination of file name, technology, business residential, speed, and provider name, which is only for government and other entities. The features of the review map page depend on the data type of the file, which will be either fixed broadband polygon data or fixed broadband location data. Finally, the last step is to submit fixed supporting data from the supporting data page. After uploading availability data, you're then required to submit supporting data for each grouping of availability data that is a part of your submission. This supporting data differs by technology and may include sections such as propagation modeling information, link budget information, and or methodologies for how you collected your data. To begin entering supporting data, click on the supporting data card on the submission overview page. To proceed to final data checks and eventually certification, you'll need to provide valid supporting data for each technology included in your submission. The supporting data required for licensed fixed wireless and unlicensed fixed wireless is dependent on the type of data you've uploaded for your availability submission. If you've uploaded polygon data, you'll need to provide six pieces of supporting data for both licensed fixed wireless and unlicensed fixed wireless. If you've uploaded location data CSV, as a part of your availability submission, you'll need to provide one piece of supporting data for both licensed fixed wireless and unlicensed fixed wireless. Let's look at how to enter your supporting data. Within the supporting data page, the table is populated with a count of necessary supporting data pieces that are required. Based on your availability data submission, for example, if your availability data includes cable and licensed fixed wireless technologies, then you'll need to provide supporting data for each of those two technologies. Each technology has different types of supporting data that are required to be included with your submission. For any technology that is missing valid supporting data, you'll see a yellow hazard symbol and a count of the required supporting data, for example, 0 of 6, displayed adjacent to that technology within the supporting data table. After you submit all required supporting data, the supporting data total at the top of the table will display a green check mark next to a summary count of supporting data, for example, 2 of 6. Some supporting data requires a file to be uploaded into the system. These files must always be in CSV format. To upload a file, click on the technology that requires the file upload in the left column, then click on the Browse button for your specified technology. Select the appropriate supporting data file from your local machine. Once you're ready to submit your file upload, click the blue Save button. Some supporting data pieces also have form entries that allow you to provide additional comments pertaining to your file's upload, and you can provide explanatory text in the text field box if necessary. After clicking Save, your file will have a yellow processing status. If your file matches the data specifications correctly, you'll see a status of Valid and a green check mark will appear. The count of supporting data for that technology will update, for example, updating from 0 of 2 to 1 of 2, and the count of total supporting data will update at the top of the table, updating from 3 of 6 to 4 of 6, for example. If your file fails validation checks, you'll receive a status of invalid. A list of data errors will be highlighted in red beneath your file. The procedure is a little different for uploading supporting data for government and or other entities. For government entities and other entities, the supporting data table will display a drop-down menu with a list of providers extracted from the entity's availability data submission. To satisfy all the supporting data requirements, you'll need to enter the supporting data for each provider included in your submission. You can access those providers by selecting them from the drop-down menu, and then the supporting data table will dynamically populate based on the selected provider. A total count of necessary supporting data is displayed in the top right-hand corner of the table, for example, the page displayed on the screen shows that the technologies included in the submission contain 15 pieces of supporting data. To progress to certification, all 15 pieces of supporting data must be provided. Once all your supporting data has been successfully uploaded, 
you'll see a green check mark and a status of valid data provided. You will then be able to proceed to the final data checks. Thank you, Ed, Chelsea, and Kimia. We will now take a short break of approximately 10 minutes and we'll return to answer questions. As a reminder, you can email questions to bdcwebinar at fcc.gov or submit them using the Q&A function in WebEx. Additional assistance materials are available online at fcc.gov forward slash broadband data forward slash help. We'll be back in just a few minutes. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. We are beginning the question and answer portion of the event. Answering questions uh, will be Sean Spivey, Senior Counsel and Chief of Staff of the BDTF, Chelsea Fallon, Senior Implementation Officer, and Edward Bartholme, Senior Outreach Director. We received a few questions already, but uh, again, I would like to add that more are welcome. Please submit them either into the BDC webinar email box or into the Q&A. Thank you. Sean, do you want to begin or should I turn it over to Ed? Um, sure, I'm, I'm happy to kick off with, uh, with a question that, that we received. Um, we're doing these in no particular order, by the way, but we are going to try and get to all of the ones that we've received so far. So um, please don't be alarmed if we're taking them slightly out of order as presented in the, in the Q&A. But um, so one of the first questions we received was, um, can we provide more information about the requirement for an engineer to certify BDC filings? And, and this is a question that we've been receiving quite a bit, so thank you for asking it. Um, on July 8th of this year, we actually issued a declaratory ruling and limited waiver of the requirement for providers uh, to have a certified professional engineer to certify their BDC filings. And that also applies to governmental entities to the same extent that they are required to submit a similar engineering certification. Um, the declaratory ruling clarified that a corporate engineering officer, as used in our prior rules, uh, may certify the filing regardless of whether or not that officer is a licensed professional engineer accredited by a state licensing agency. Um, the corporate officer only needs to have a Bachelor of Science in Engineering uh, and has and needs to have direct knowledge of or responsibility for the carrier's network design and, and construction. Uh, the limited waiver allows for an otherwise qualified engineer to certify the BDC filing. Uh, in addition to if, if you happen to have engaged a licensed professional engineer or you, you have someone that meets that corporate engineering officer requirement. Um, in the limited waiver, we explained that an otherwise qualified engineer has to possess one of the two following categories of um, qualifications, either a bachelor's or postgraduate degree in electrical engineering, electronic technology, or another similar technical discipline, and at least seven years of relevant experience in broadband network design and or performance, uh, or the second prong would be a specialized training relevant to broadband network engineering and design, deployment or performance, and at least 10 years of relevant experience in broadband network engineering design or performance. If you wish to have your filing certified by an otherwise qualified engineer, you must include the following certifying language in the explanations and comments box of your submission in the system. Quote, the engineer certifying our submission meets the minimum qualifications outlined in the declaratory ruling and limited waiver adopted on July 8th, 2022 in WC docket number 19-195. Uh, that, that language is included, I believe, in the last paragraph of the waiver order, which is available on our website under the resources tab. Um, 
I would note that uh, licensed professional engineers or corporate engineering officers making the certification do not need to enter that statement in the explanations and comments section. It's only those entities uh, using an otherwise qualified engineer as defined in the waiver order. Uh, the limited waiver applies to the first three BDC filing periods. So the data submitted as of June 30th of this year, December 31st of this year, and then June 30th of 2023. And again, you can find more information, including the text of the declaratory ruling and limited waiver, uh, as well as a knowledge base article on the BDC homepage at fcc.gov forward slash broadband data. So hopefully that's helpful information. But again, if you if you have additional questions about the certification requirement, you can either read the knowledge base article or even submit a help request at the uh, in the help center. And uh, Kimmy had dropped a link to the the um, the waiver it's document itself in the chat, and then we've also included a link to that knowledge base article in the chat. Um, so we we did get a couple of other questions. So maybe Chelsea, if I could throw one to you, um, if a tribe already has an FRN as a licensee, for example, a, a two point five gigahertz license, do they need a different FRN to access the fabric? No, they, it would be fine to use the existing FRN to just go through the process that we described. Um, however, um, please make sure that the the entity type associated with the FRN, um, it sounds like it should most likely be tribal, um, you know, is, is indicated, selected in cores, um, because then when you go into the BDC system and fill out the entity information page there and select tribal governmental entity there, then um, those two would need to align. Thank, thank you for that. And, and maybe sort of um, following along that same lines, um, can a, may a tribe request the fabric data set? Yes, so um, tribal government entity can request access to the fabric data set. Um, it can start that process um, anytime. And just to give a quick recap of, of the process, um, they will need to uh, obtain the FCC registration number, the FRN um, through the, the commission registration system or cores. Uh, log into the BDC system and fill out that entity information page. Um, then after receiving um, an email from CostQuest, execute the licensing agreement, and then they'll be able to download the fabric data set. Thanks. Thank you. And, and sort of to keep the dropping things in the chat process going, we'll, we'll dump the link to that Help Center article that walks you through the steps you need to take there um, as well, so that hopefully we're aggregating all these links so you've got them handy in the, ch in the chat function there. Um, Sean, I'm gonna pivot to you for a second. Um, what if a tribe does not have postal addressing? Um, are latitude, longitude acceptable as sort of a pathway or a way to participate in the fabric challenge process? Yeah, great question. Thanks, Ed. Um, so for purposes of participating in the fabric challenge process, uh, we have published a, a bulk fabric data specification document uh, that was released on July 1st or 2nd. And it kind of talks, it, it provides information on the different categories of challenges that will be acceptable in the data that must come as part of submitting a challenge. Um, so while the fabric data will include lat long information for the locate for the broadband serviceable locations in that data set, um, in terms of adding a new location or submitting a challenge to an existing location, there is a, a the capability in the data specification document to um, indicate that the address that that, that, the, that the location just does not have an address. Um, so, so to answer the question, it is not absolutely necessary that postal addressing be included if submitting a challenge to a fabric location. Uh, we, you are capable of indicating that the location just does not have a postal address, 
but where addresses are available, they should be included uh, as one of the fields in your fabric challenges. And, and just a flag for folks, some of the same techniques that we showed in the video for matching addresses, you can use those to, to try to, to match lat long, right? So like once you've got that fabric data set and you've got your own data set um, for the list of, of sort of your locations, um, some of those same text matching capabilities um, will can be used to to identify and find location IDs for locations that are already included in the fabric to help inform your efforts as you start to prepare for filing challenges. Um, so thank you. And I, I think we've got another one that's coming your way, Sean. Uh, for the option for tribes that do not have a designated entity primarily responsible for mapping or tracking broadband internet access service coverage, does the tribal entity authenticated via cores and the BDC system still have to submit some type of letter from an, from an elected representative 45 days prior to the opening of a filing window? So, so someone has been reading our, our April 14th public notice closely. So thank you for that. Um, yes, so there, there is a limited circumstance in which um, in the scenario that's described in the question where, where a designated entity, where an entity has not been designated by a, an elected tribal leader as primarily responsible for mapping or tracking broadband service coverage, um, we will accept data from, from an entity that has it, even if they aren't kind of designated through that letter process from an, a duly elected tribal leader. Uh, so long as that entity has kind of gone through step one that I described, which is authenticating itself in the commission registration system and the BDC system as a tribal governmental entity. Basically, we just need to know that the person submitting the data is actually a representative of a tribal government, uh, but they do not need to take that second step of uploading a letter from an elected tribal leader um, if they have not been designated by an elected tribal leader as primarily responsible for mapping or tracking broadband service coverage. Uh, one thing that is also noted in the PN though, and I'm sure the questioner picked up on this, but um, for others, uh, in the event that two entities attempt to upload conflicting data for the same geographic area and technology, uh, we will not automatically make that data publicly available, but rather we are going to go back to those two competing entities to ask them to resolve the conflict between their data. And if they are unable to do so, then we will actually need an elected tribal leader to instruct the FCC on how to resolve the conflicts in the data. Um, so, you know, if, if, one entity, you know, collects information on mobile wireless service and another entity collects information on, you know, uh, fixed terrestrial fixed deployment, then that won't be an issue because there are different technology codes. But if two entities try and submit, you know, conflicting coverage data for the same technology in the same geographic area, so either, you know, a, a list of locations or uh, you know, if they submit polygon data, uh, overlapping polygons, that's going to trigger an, an error in our system, and we are going to go back and try and get some resolution before publishing that data. Uh, while we're waiting to see if further questions come in, may I ask uh, a question of Sean myself? Uh, Sean, could you, it's a request, could you please talk about the two different types of challenge process? Sure, yeah. So um, Ed, Ed described this a little, quite a bit in his presentation, but um, I think it's helpful just to um, understand or, or kind of reiterate that um, there are two distinct but equally important challenge processes that are going to help support and validate and refine the data that we collect as part of this broadband data collection. The first are challenges to the location information in the fabric. And I think we talked about that quite a bit on this, on this webinar. Um, and there will be, within that, there will be kind of two methods for submitting challenges. Uh, there will be an opportunity for individuals to 
go onto the maps once they're published later in the fall and submit a challenge to a to an individual point or an individual broadband serviceable location as reflected on the map. Um, but in addition, there will be opportunities for service providers, tribal governments, other other people who have access to data in bulk to submit bulk challenges to fabric locations. So and that is that is why we were encouraging ISPs and governmental entities to execute those fabric licensing agreements uh, now because the, you are able to do so uh, to start the process so that you can get access to your fabric data, begin reviewing it, going through the steps that we outlined in some of these tutorial videos um, to add locations to the next iteration, to submit challenges uh, to the current fabric data so that locations can potentially uh, be added to the next iteration of the fabric uh, contingent upon our resolution of those challenges. Um, so separate and apart from the fabric challenge process, there is a second challenge process for the availability data. Um, and obviously the availability data will need to be published and made available. Uh, a lot of references to available, sorry, but uh, <laughs> we will need to publish and make available the broadband availability data that service providers submit to us um, in order for that challenge process to begin. Um, and so once the maps go live this fall, uh, then similar to what I was saying about the fabric, there will be kind of two mechanisms for submitting availability challenges. Individuals will be able to go to the map, uh, type in their address or their location, uh, and see the information that's reported by the providers. And if they have um, evidentiary bases for challenging that, that data, they can submit a challenge very easily through the map interface. But uh, there will also be the, avail the, the opportunity for bulk challenges to the availability data, again, by governmental entities, by other internet service providers, um, and by other entities and we will be providing more information in the not too distant future on some of the data specifications and other processes around those bulk challenges to the availability data. Well, I, I don't see any additional questions coming in at this point. I want to reiterate that you can still send questions into the Broadband Data Task Force. Uh, we've already listed a number of means by which you can do so. So please don't view this as a, a last step. Um, all the questions that came in today will help shape our further tribal outreach on the BDC as we head into the challenge process in the fall. Sean, do you wanna say a few words? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I just wanna say thank you to, um, to ONAP, uh, to the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, to my colleagues on the Broadband Data Task Force for helping put together this webinar. But most importantly, thank you to those of you who are participating. Um, your participation is going to be in the, in the broadband data collection uh, in this webinar and getting access to fabric data in, in the challenge processes. All of that is going to be absolutely critical to improving and refining our um, availability data that we make available to, to stakeholders over time, which will help you know, inform investments in broadband infrastructure funding and other programs, both here at the FCC in states and in other federal agencies. Um, I should also put in a plug for um, a uh, in-person event that ONAP is uh, hosting on August 9th and 10th, I believe in Tulsa. Um, I, I will let Sayuri uh, say more about that if she wants, and hopefully I'm not I'm not stealing her thunder on that on that event. But um, but again, I just want to reiterate that uh, we are here to provide assistance. We have a team of um, technical assistance resources that can that can help from uh, you know the time that you submit a question into our help center. Um, we want to help you in whatever way we can participate in this process. So please uh, review the, the, the videos, the knowledge base articles that are available in the Help Center, uh, submit requests to, to uh, ask specific questions, and um, we, will, we will provide the assistance 
in a timely manner. And those questions do help inform kind of our broader efforts at outreach to, to all constituencies. So thank you again for your questions today. Um, they, they are going to help us as we continue to do outreach and education about this new process. Um, but Sire, maybe I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you very much, Sean. Uh, as Sean said, on August 9th and 10th, with many thanks to the Cherokee Nation, ONAP will be holding its first in-person FCC tribal workshop since 2019 in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We'll be covering the BDC, of course, and the Broadband Data Task Force will be sending a representative to the event. Um, we'll be covering our own important FCC initiatives at the workshop, but I want to also note that NTIA is confirmed to be joining us to discuss its broadband programs. Uh, information about the event is available on the FCC's main webpage, and you can also send an email to native at FCC.gov. Um, with that, I'd like to thank the staff of the Broadband Data Task Force and all of our participants once again, and bring this webinar to a close. Thank you all, and have a very good rest of the afternoon.